I pushed open the door at the bottom, which opened into a long, wide corridor, with heavy, thick doors on one side and a solid wall on the other. Sunshine poured in from some of the open doors. In the first empty room we had a good view over the Vatican Gardens and saw many, many gardeners busy among the plants. The next room was the same. I pushed open the third door and saw a man sitting behind an elaborate desk reading a book. He smiled and I said, Buongiorno, come sta? He replied in Italian and said he was very, very pleased to someone speaking English. My accent gave me away. He told us he hadn't spoken English for many years and we were the first he'd met in that time. We chatted about the garden, the Roman ruins, my trip onto the roof. Then he kept looking at his watch and asked if he'd kindly show us the way out to our truck. He stood up still smiling and agreed. When I asked him who he was and what his job was in the Vatican, he replied, I'm the Pope, Pius XII, and I'm very pleased to have met you both. And Would you like me to bless you before you go? I didn't really understand, but Benny did. And he knelt down before the Pope, who said the blessing with his hand on Benny's head. Then he turned to me. I hesitated. Benny said, go on, Lofty, have a go. So I knelt down and the Pope, the Pope blessed me. Then off we three went along the corridor, chatted as we walked past the astonished guards towards the entrance of the cathedral and our truck. We all shook hands and off we drove back to Valletri. Back at our camp, we told everybody where we'd been and who we'd seen and everything. I don't think they believed us. Next day over the radio, we were told to drive through Rome on the road to the north, keep going and await instructions. Because we'd done the trip before, Benny and I led the convoy into Rome along our previous route, passing the Colosseum, the Fountain and St Peter's, going along deserted roads. Whether our trip into the city was before or after General Mark Clark's official entry, I don't really know. But we kept on going to the north on the coast road, past Civi di Vecchia towards Grosseto and Pisa, unable to catch up to the advancing front line and the retreating Germans. We drove north from Rome along the west coast, stopping to cool the engines and to spend a few nights near Grosseto. The German Field Marshal Kessering was conserving his army for a stand on a suitable river beyond Pisa. Our campsite was in fields, not far from the sea, so we were able to enjoy a swim once again. The beach was narrow and steep, with deep water nearby. One morning, we saw two Italians in a rowing boat, fishing close to the shore. It was getting hot. One of them on the boat took off his shirt, dived over the side to have a swim around the boat, while his friend was fishing. We were splashing about in the water close to the beach, when the Italian swimmer shouted loudly, then disappeared under the water, seconds later to be heaved upwards with his arms outstretched to disappear again. The man in the boat had seen this and he yelled, Peschimano! Peschimano! Shark! Shark! and started to roll like mad to the shore. We were all out of the sea in a flash. After the shark incident at Salerno, that concluded our swimming with the great white sharks in the area. The next day over the radio, we had orders to return to Naples for a refit, ready for our next landing somewhere. On the return drive, we stopped at Civi di Vecchia, an attractive seaside resort with a good beach. We occupied part of an, an Italian military hospital with all mod cons across the promenade from the beach that, were, that was full of, of dozens of American LCTs and LSTs being loaded up with supplies ready for the invasion. Benny and I had been driving around the area in our spare time and this time we were returning from Tarquina, a very attractive small town driving along the promenade 
we were signalled to stop by an American naval officer. When he said, are you guys limeys, we guessed what he wanted, and we were correct. He said he would exchange some of the food supplies on his LST for some booze, but we should return with a much larger truck. As we lived just across the promenade, that was no problem. We told Taffy, our cook, about the deal, and he quickly emptied a 10-ton truck ready for use. Benny drove down onto the beach, backed up the LST ramp for the, U and the American sailors to load a variety of boxes onto the back of our truck. When the tires began to get flat, I told the, tailor, I told the sailors to stop so that Benny could drive away. Down the ramp went the truck to dig in on the soft sand up to the axles, even with four-wheel drive. It took our, little, our last bottle of whiskey to persuade a bulldozer driver in the next LSD to tow us off the beach. Seven bottles of booze got us enough food stores to last for several months when we got into southern France. It was always our booze in exchange for food, never the officers. They benefited, but they never made a contribution. The drive down to Naples continued over the same roads, it was quite uneventful, and brought back happy memories of Capri and Ischia. The embarkation staging post at uh, Pozzuoli was a most depressing place. It was dirty and scruffy, in a terrible state of repair. Most of the buildings had been badly shaken and cracked when Vesuvius erupted a few months earlier. We checked our gear after the long drive and we went aboard a well-worn US LST ready for off. Conditions aboard were very, very bad. It was most unusual for an American boat and I wasn't looking forward at all to a long sea trip to France. With the fleet of LSTs and LCTs, we sailed from Pozzuola, Naples, along the coast of Italy to pass between Sardinia and Corsica on towards southern France. German radar must have seen this massive armada, but they didn't know where it was going to strike. Conditions on board were poor, and as far as I was concerned, the sooner we landed the better. Miles from the shore, we could see the shoreline ablaze from naval bombardment and aerial bombing. Our LST slowed to a halt when we heard the roar of many low-flying aircraft overhead. We presumed it was for an airdrop. At dawn, we sailed on and saw the horrific result of the parachute drop. The sea was covered with floating parachutes anchored by the bodies of soldiers underneath who drowned, heavily laden with thick uniforms, guns and ammunition. Very slowly, our LST crawled and picked its way towards the beach for us to land. Nearby, several modified LCTs were converted to rocket ships and they were firing hundreds of rockets in salvos across the seafront towards the defending Germans in the town. The noise of the guns and the scream of the rockets was deafening. Nobody spoke on deck. Most people were overawed by the bedlam and the sight of the parachutes. The LST ground onto the beach, the doors opened, the ramp was lowered and off we drove. There was some sniper fire, we didn't worry us. We crossed the sand to the promenade at Saint-Tropez. Our convoy assembled on the road, then drove westwards along the promenade to the end and found a narrow private road leading to the grounds of a very large chateau. That was to be our billet in the front line. We assembled straight away on the lawn in front of the chateau and switched on to find the radar cover across the bay, out to the sea and across to the Pyrenees very, very good. The radar view to the north was obscured by low hills towards the valley of the River Rhone. 